In calculus one and two, you study what's called single variable calculus. Now, in those courses, you deal with a function that has one input variable, and that's why we call it single variable calculus. Now, studying functions of one variable is very useful because in things like physics, this allows you to study velocity. It's a function of time. Now, calculus also allows you to do other sorts of geometric things. So again, if you have a function, you can ask a variety of different questions. So for example, if I draw a tangent line at this point, what's the slope of the tangent? You learn that it's the value of the derivative at that point. If you'd like the area underneath a curve, you learn that the area is given by an integral and you would integrate this function from zero to a. In calculus three, we need to study what's called multivariable calculus. Why do we need multivariable calculus? Now, multivariable calculus allows you to study functions that have more than one input. So for example, you could have two inputs into your function and then spit something else out called z, or you might want to have f of x, y, and z. Now, as a simple example, let's say you're interested in the temperature in a room. And the temperature is going to depend on the location in your room. And how do we describe locations in 3D space? Now, a very natural idea is for us to extend our 2D Cartesian coordinates into 3D. Cartesian coordinates are a set of perpendicular axes. What you do is you say, here's a point in this two-dimensional plane. So we call it a 2D plane. When you give the coordinates of a point like this as A and B, the first value tells you how far along the X direction you are. The second one tells you how far along the Y direction you are. Now, remember that others are possible. You could, for example, talk about polar coordinates. For now, we will stick with Cartesian coordinates. So what you can do is you can extend this into a 3D Cartesian system. That means you're going to need three perpendicular axes. Now, I'm just going to draw this set of three perpendicular axes like this. And what we need to do is figure out how to label these. For now, I'm going to write it as x, y, and z. And then I'm going to talk about a point. We'll call it a, b, and c. That point would be at some location a in the x-axis, b in the y-axis, and then c in the z-axis. Now, we have to label these axes according to what's called the right-hand rule. You're going to take your right hand, sorry to all the lefties out there, you're going to take your fingers of your right hand and they're going to point in the x-axis direction. You're going to curl your fingers into the y direction and then your thumb will point in the z direction. Other options kind of work like this. If I were to take those same three axes, if I wanted to put x right here, that means I have to curl my fingers in the direction of Y, so they'll have to point up there, and then my thumb would have to point as Z. Or the other option would be to say this, hey, I want this to be the X axis. That means I have to curl my fingers down toward here, and then Z will point out accordingly. Now I'm just gonna talk about some terminology that's related to Cartesian coordinate systems. Two-dimensional space is going to be the set of all points x and y like this, where x is a real number and y is a real number. We're going to call this space R2. And we're going to say that 3D space, we're going to give the name R3. And it's going to be the set of all points x, y, z where x is a real number, y is a real number, and z is a real number. 
in R2, when we talk about the Cartesian plane, we're still going to follow the right-hand rule. We have what are called quadrants. We split up the whole space into four pieces, where both X and Y are positive. We're going to refer to that as quadrant one. And then you learn about other naming conventions for the other one. You essentially follow this direction. When we're in R3, it gets a little more messy. If I were to draw the full set of axes like this, if this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, we follow the right-hand rule to get the z-axis there. What we do is we break up this three-dimensional space into what are called octants, or eight equal-sized pieces. We are not going to bother numbering them. All we care about, the first octant. In the first octant, this is where x is greater than 0, y is greater than 0, and z is greater than 0. So in our case, the first octant is always going to look like this, x, y, and z. Now, another thing that we're going to talk about are what are called coordinate planes. In this bottom part, this is going to be points where x is free, y is free, and z is equal to 0. So this is going to be called the xy plane. This is going to be called the yz plane. And this is where x is equal to 0, y and z are free to be whatever number we'd like. And over here, we're going to talk about the xz plane. And here, this is where y is 0, and x and z are free to be whatever we'd like. We're going to discuss objects in R2 and R3. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time in R2 discussing these objects because that's something you've probably seen a whole lot before. So if we focus on R2 like this, if we have an equation that has our two letters, x and y, we're going to call this a curve. Now, a nice example of a curve is something like this. And this is the equation of a unit circle. Its center is 0, 0, and its radius is related to this number. It's 1. So it's essentially the set of all points that are one unit away from this center. Now, if we are in R3, any equation that has x, y, and z, we're now going to call this a surface. Now, here's an example of a surface. So let's say z equals 1. So this is the set of all points in R3 that has z equals 1. So another way to think of it is this is the set of all points that's going to have coordinates with x and y and 1. This is going to end up looking like an infinite sheet of paper. Now, on this infinite sheet of paper, x and y can do whatever they'd like, but z must have a value of 1. So let's put our x and our y and our z. We are intersecting the z axis at 1. Any other point that lives in here, this piece of paper is made up of infinitely many points and this plane go out to infinity right they extend out everywhere they form this plane this point right here would have coordinates 0 0 and 1 so if i traced it up this point right there would have coordinates of 1 y and 1 because it has to live on the plane z is 1 it has to cross the x axis at 1 and let's say this is at the location y is 2. This point right here would be some value of x, y is 2, z is 1. Now again, planes contain infinitely many points. They're infinite sheets of paper with infinitely many points. They go out to infinity. We're going to extend this idea of geometry. We're going to discuss the following sets of points. Now in this first one, it's going to be a bit of an extension of what I talked about a little earlier. 
Now, we've already talked about this z equals 1. Now, this looks familiar. This looks like a circle that has a radius of 2 and a center of 1 and 2. So what I need to do is combine all of these ideas. Now, remember that we've talked about z equals 1 being a plane. We talked about the axes here. So here is the location 1, here is the location 2. If I were to trace that up, it would have to intersect the point that has coordinates 1, 2, and 1. I have to take all the points that trace out a circle of radius 2. So essentially what I'm going to get is a curve. It's a circle in the plane z equals 1. I can go further. Here we've put a condition on all three variables, x, y, and z. So if I were just to write x minus 1 squared, y minus 2 squared is equal to 4, and I want to talk about this in R3, that means I have no info about z. That means this z is free. So we're going to go back to our coordinate axes again. And we're going to take x is 1, y is 2, and sort of trace it down there. So for example, I could draw myself a circle in the z equals 0 plane. And then I could draw another one up here in the z equals 1 plane. So if you could imagine stacking circle on top of circle on top of circle on top of circle, what you would see is you would trace out something that should look familiar to you. You would trace out what's called a cylinder, and it would be a circular cylinder. Now what's really important to note is that this is a shell of points, and when you collect all of those points, they make the shape of a circular cylinder. And this shell is infinite in the z direction. If I were to add some more information, so for example, if I were to go x minus 1 squared, y minus 2 squared, less than or equal to 4, and I were to say z is between 0 and 2, so extending what we talked about before, this less than or equal to these tell us that we are filling the surface. And what we would have again would be our cylinder. And this would be in the z equals 0 plane. And essentially our cylinder would go up until z equals 2. But it would be filled. And this would essentially be a solid cylinder, and it would be a circular cylinder. Now there's a really important point here. In R2, let's say we talked about x minus 1 squared, y minus 2 squared was 4. This was a circle. But when I went to R3, depending on what other information I had, this could have been many things. It could have ended up being a curve, it could have ended up being a surface that was a cylinder. Are there any others? You can actually extend it in other ways. You can talk about something called a sphere, which in your mind you should think of as a ball. And this is just a three, another 3D generalization of a circle. And to talk about a sphere, you need one important idea. Now remember that the definition of a circle is that it's the set of all points x and y that are a distance, and that's important here, of r from this center, let's say h and k. And in two coordinates like this, you pick a center, h and k. I want it to be equally spaced like this. You pick any point on the circle, it's an x and a y. So in order to generalize to R3, we need to talk about 
distance in R3. Now in R2, distances are very simple because they come from right angle triangles. If I give you a point x1, y1, and I give you some other point x2, y2, the Pythagorean theorem allows you to connect all of these things. Because these are all at right angles, you can get a nice relationship. If this is the distance we're looking for, we know that d squared is x squared plus y squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. x is just going to be x2 minus x1 all squared, and then y will be y2 minus y1 all squared. So if distance is always assumed to be greater than or equal to zero, then we can take the square root and we will only be interested in the positive case. And we end up with this distance formula. In R3, you can draw a similar picture and come up with a similar result. If I give you two points, x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, I'm interested in connecting them here with a line, and I'm interested in this distance. You could imagine that these form some right triangle. We'll call this thing h, and we'll call this thing l. d squared is h squared plus l squared. You could project that down, and there's l. And then l is actually formed by another right triangle right here. And then this would be capital X and capital Y. And of course, I'm being lazy and not putting my axes down. And so this would end up giving you h squared, x squared, plus y squared, because you're using Pythagorean theorem again. h is just going to be the difference in height between those two points. So d squared will be z2 minus z1 squared, and then the x's and the y's will be the same as they were before. And if d is a positive number, then what you're going to get is the usual x2 minus x1 squared, y2 minus y1 squared, z2 minus z1 squared. This line up here tells us what we're interested in here. We're going to define the sphere as a set of all points in R3, and we'll call them x, y, and z, that are a distance d from some sort of center. And that'll be h, k, and l. If you were to draw your 3D axes. You can pick some center, h, k, and l. You can draw some sort of distance. And then what you've got is a new type of object. And essentially, this sphere is really the shell of the ball. This has been an introduction to 3D coordinates, a little bit of 3D geometry. All of this is going to be necessary when studying multivariable functions.